Amen. Well, what is your purpose on this planet? I'm just gonna get real deep right from the jump. Why do you exist? I know for me growing up, my purpose was attached to my future profession. Did you ever get that uh, a question when you were growing up? Like, what do you wanna do when you grow up? Do you guys get that, you remember? So let's just get back to elementary school real quick. Like, what did you want to be? Just give me a couple real quick. What did you want to be when you grow up? Marine Astronaut, for sure. Marine, Marine biologist? <laughs> Cookie, what, what's going on? That's sick, dude. All right, just come on, give me some other. Basketball, pro basketball player? I'm with you on that, yeah. How about the nosebleed up here? President. Hey, let's go. I don't know, man, you turn gray real quick and you become a president, but I like it. We need a good president that's biblically sound for sure. I, I, uh, I think early on I wanted to be, um, I think it was like a, a policeman, maybe something like that, fireman. I wanted to help people. It was funny because in third grade I wrote a paper, I wanted to be a God man. I didn't even know what the term pastor was. Isn't it interesting that I eventually... Then I shifted, and of course, I got involved in athletics and wanted to be a, I wanted to be a professional basketball player, <laughs> a little bit too short, a little bit too slow, and somehow got a scholarship to play football, so it ended up becoming, I wanted to be a, a pro football player. And by God's grace, in 1997, I showed up to training camp at the New York Jets. And it was interesting because for me, it's like, oh my goodness, my whole life, my purpose was connected to my profession. I finally arrived. I'm gonna have peace in my soul. I'm gonna live out the rest of my days just in bliss because I've made it. Well, that was until about two weeks into training camp where I blew my hamstring out and Bill Parcells took me into his office and said, uh, sorry, sorry, pal, but we're gonna let you go. And then what happens at that point? Your, your purpose that's attached to your profession is actually taken away, and now you're asking yourself, why am I here? What's, what's my purpose? Why, why, am I, why do I even exist on this planet? And how many people are so confused to this day when you see we're struggling for purpose, and when we find out, or, or we make the, well, really, there's no God, and we're just living without purpose, and so many people tragically are taking their lives today because they've never arrived at this place of purpose. So even though we're gonna get deep, like I hope it helps some people here, and maybe you're here today, and you've been trying to find purpose in pleasure, possessions, your profession, all kinds of different things, and although they feel good for a while, eventually you still become empty in your soul. Did you know that you're pre-programmed with a hole in your soul? The God-shaped hole. Have you ever heard of that statement? We just come out of the womb, God pre-programs this like God-shaped hole, and we try to fill the God-shaped hole with all these other things. And a lot of them are good. Nothing wrong with working hard and acquiring possessions as long as they don't possess you. Nothing wrong with, man, have a calling in life. I love being a pastor most days. It's beautiful. But if that's my identity and that's like why I exist, man, I, I, I'm gonna struggle. Ecclesiastes 3.11, this book that we're studying, Solomon writes, he says that God's placed eternity in our hearts. Eternity. We can't get around it. And this becomes the rub because we're made for another planet. We're engineered for eternity, but we're living in this temporary world. And there's a friction because of it. And you guys see my little, my illustration, this is my go-to illustration for the next year, just so you guys know. And I just wanna play with around with it a little bit. I know you're like, dude, do you have anything else? I'm like, not really. But if you wanna study theology, just go, go serve in the toddler room. That's what I've been doing lately. I just, I love serving in the toddlers. And this is probably my favorite teaching tool. And why is that? Well, because 
you throw the shapes on the floor, and you about three toddlers, and they each grab a shape, and they just come, you know, they're just running to you. And it doesn't matter what, like, this happens to be, I don't know, this green semicircle moon smile. I don't know what this is. But they'll come in and they'll just start just trying to jam it in the, in the deal. And me as a loving God, <laughs> I try to steer their hand and put it in the right place to make sure it fits. But most of them, they're just... And they put the half circle in the star. And it hit me, this like deep the theological moment was like, that's humans. <laughs> the star, this, this right here, it's, there's only one way to find purpose and meaning in my heart. It's a God-shaped hole, and yet I'm trying to take pleasure and possessions and position and people and that new relationship and try to jam it in. And it's interesting, because at first, it like kind of fits, and you're kind of fulfilled. You're like, yeah, isn't it the best, the new relationship? It's all new. And you're texting each other. <laughs> Kissing all the time. Ooh, like, let's just be honest. Like, sometimes sin feels good. Ooh, ah, yes. And then the next day happens. Ah, why'd I do that? Or the new relationship rubs off. Or the new car. The new, there's nothing better than the new car smell. I'm fulfilled. I remember I got this Honda Accord. I thought I'd just, it was, got the greatest deal on it. I'm like, yes, I'm fulfilled. I got the car. And I brought it home. You're like, Honda Accord, what's wrong with you? Like, go for the Range Rover. Sorry, I'm just giving. I remember bringing it home. And like, one of the kids or something, there was like a, 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 a this, what is a metal piece, and it fell and drilled the top of the hood of the car. I'm like, ah, I was just fulfilled in life, and now... That's a stupid illustration. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what it is for you. In our text, we've been reading Solomon. Solomon, <laughs> this dude is, is crazy. He's the richest, wisest, like baller of a guy. He was the king of Israel. had everything he wanted. He was kind of like, in modern terms, a cross between like Tiger Woods, Tom Brady, and Jake Hers. You know, I mean, the guy was just, <laughs> he had it all going. I always make fun of Jake. He's like the best looking guy I know. Like I always, in heaven, I'm gonna look like Jake. <laughs> and, and so, but what's interesting when you read it, didn't you read it? Like Solomon goes through life trying to find purpose. Here's the phrase, under the sun. And every time he tries it, he comes up short, and it doesn't quite fit. It's, it's so close. And we'll study them. We'll go through these. You already read it, but I just want to fill in some of the gaps. He's a real smart guy, so he tries to find fulfillment and purpose in the intellect and trying to learn new things, which is great, but if that's the purpose of life, we're going to come up short. And then he tries pleasure. And think about this, dude. Like, you have access to whatever you want. I think, I think this book is so good for us because most of us in this room, not all, but most of us, we have limited access to pleasure. Some people in here, you have so much money and so much power and so much position, you can snap your fingers and have anyone or anything you want. Most of us are still in, pro we're like trying to get there thinking that's gonna fulfill and it doesn't. Solomon has the benefit of teaching us when you get there, it's still empty. Some of you in here have gotten there and it's still empty. This is a very good manual for life that will help all of us in this place. He acquires possessions. We'll get to it. And then at the end, in chapter 12, he's like, you know what, I've, I've tried all this, but here's the deal. Fear God, keep his commandments, enjoy life. Yeah. <laughs> that has never happened in my life. 
This word is, this is anointed word for y'all right then, right now. The Spirit wants to speak and set some people free at Love Church today. <laughs> oh. I was, as I was considering this, God hit me with this word. You want soul satisfaction, make the purpose pivot. The purpose pivot. I was thinking of the companies after the pandemic or during the pandemic, they had two choices. Continue on as things were and go bankrupt or pivot and make a new decision and thrive. Do you know that IBM, during the pandemic, they sent 75,000 of their employees home and they made $50 million. You know, some people are like, you're, no, and, and, and they taint because they were so stubborn to stay copacetic as always. Some pivoted and are thriving. Can I just submit to you right now? You can continue to try to force your purpose here under the sun, but you will eventually go bankrupt in life, or you can make the ultimate pivot, come to Christ and have life in the sun, not under the sun, and be fulfilled. The pivot. So the title of the message, the purpose pivot. I love this. This made my decade. Ecclesiastes 1, let's dial into this first perspective and purpose that Solomon pursued for fulfillment and came up short. Number one, write it down, intellectualism. And I'll just give you a definition real quick of intellectualism. It's the belief that reason is the final principle of reality. Here it is, watch this. The devotion to intellectual pursuits. Think about that for a second. And, and let me just say, once again, I already said this, but I wanna affirm this, because I, I don't think I shared this well enough last night. There's nothing wrong with learning. In fact, I, I say this a lot. Who, who, who's the readers in the group, right? Raise your hand, you love, see, this is a good thing, right? I say this a lot, leaders are readers, and readers are leaders. And, and my wife is a perfect example. Like, she's always learning, and I love it. But the problem is, if, it's, if that's my purpose, is, is continuing to learn and be the smartest person in the room, and that's how I find purpose and fulfillment, I'm gonna come up short. Time and time and time again. This is what he says. Look at chapter one, verse 16. This is Solomon and he, and he says this, I said to myself, look, I'm wiser than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me, which was true. I have greater wisdom and knowledge than any of them. He's not being prideful, that's just simple truth. So I set out to learn everything from wisdom to madness and folly, but I learned firsthand that pursuing all of this is like chasing the wind. The greater, my, watch this, this hit me. The greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. To increase knowledge only increases sorrow. If you read in 1 Kings chapter three, it's a powerful story. I would jot it down and go read it for your homework. It's the story of when God came to Solomon in a dream. And King Solomon has the privilege and honor of taking leadership from his father David, and he's leading God's people. And God comes to him in a dream, and he, imagine this, by the way, he comes to you in a dream, he's like, hey, Solomon, um, whatever you want, just ask for it, and I'll give it to you. Like genie in the bottle type dream. Wouldn't that be the best, if, he, if God came to you, like, whatever you want. And Solomon, he, it's funny, he, he actually, in the text, it says, I'm like a little child that I can't even figure out where I'm going. I need wisdom, God, to lead your people. I count it a privilege this leadership position, I need wisdom. I don't wanna blow it. He didn't ask for riches or fame or the neck of his enemies. He wanted wisdom because he really cared. And God goes, ding, 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 ding. That's the answer. He said, man, I love your heart, Solomon. Because you asked that, I'm gonna make you the wisest person to ever live. 
And by the way, I'm just gonna throw in for parting gifts. You're gonna be uh, the richest dude, you know? Like, you, you're gonna rule over your enemies. Like, you're gonna be a baller shot caller. Like, bro, you are the man because your heart is right. And so he is, the wisest dude. You ever, you guys have those friends, by the way, like the wisest, like the smartest person in the room? Raise your hand. <laughs> no one wants to raise their hand. I have plenty of friends that are just so brilliant. This is definitely not one of my struggles in pursuing this for purpose, by the way. You're like, I understand that, okay? You're my pastor, I get it. But I have friends that, that have. They've had struggles. I, I have one friend. Actually, we just had him over this week for dinner. And I coached this kid way back in the day. Super brilliant guy. I mean, graduates top of the class. Smart, smart dude. And, but the tragedy was... I think his smartness kept him away from the kingdom because he outsmarted himself with everything, with all this intellectualism and pursuits of this, pursuing this, and it was a long road. In fact, we had him more for, he, by the way, good news, came, came to Christ a couple of years ago, is on fire, and I told him, you have a unique anointing to reach people just like you, real smart people. Because he was talking at, even at dinner, and I'm looking at, you know those people that you're like smiling, like just smile and nod, because you don't understand one thing that they're saying. Like, yeah, yeah, dude, right, 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 <laughs> right. Yeah, of course, yeah. And like, you're kind of like trying to Google like the word to see like what it actually means. Solomon was, was like this, and he was, he, was, he was learning, he was studying and learning, he was trying to find purpose, and he's like, man, matter of fact, the more I studied, the more like depressed I got wasn't fulfilling, wasn't hitting that deep God-shaped hole in my heart. He, he was like the AI app, uh, was it chat something, or what's it called, chat GPT? He's downloaded the, like Solomon was chat GPT. Uh, hey, hey, you just say it in there, like write me a business plan, or like write me a, a message on Ecclesiastes and the emptiness of life under the sun. That's what I did, by the way. This is the message that... Artificial intelligent, no, I'm just messing with you. All right, no shenanigans. You guys ready for number two? Um, he tried this, hedonism. Hedonism, and here's the definition, the doctrine that pleasure or happiness is the highest good. Remember now, this is pursuing pleasure and happiness under the sun apart from God. This is so key to understand because once again, Nothing wrong with pleasure. Nothing wrong with happiness. To me, I look at God, God's a great father. Do you think that I want anything but, but, but joy and happiness for my children? Of course I do. But if this, this, this pursuit of deep peace and satisfaction in our life is only pleasure and happiness disconnected from God, it's hedonism, and it's gonna run short. Solomon, Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse one, look, look what he says. He says, I said, I said to myself, well, the intellectualism didn't work, so come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look at the good things in life. Isn't that interesting when you drive into Nebraska, what is it called? It's called the, the good life. But I found that this too is meaningless. I said, laughter is silly. What good is it to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to get hammered and cheer myself with much wine. It's while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. And this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during their brief time in this world. He tried hedonism. And boy, he did a good job at it. Some of us, man, we, again, we don't have access to resources and opportunities that Solomon did. Solomon went full send hedonism. I'm going to find that, that I'm gonna itch that scratch in my soul. I'm gonna get there. And even the greatest pleasures that man can experience still fell short. He was going with this theology. If it feels good, life, liberty, and the pursuit of, isn't it interesting? In the very fabric of our foundation of our country is that very statement. 
Hedonism is the core of our, of our culture. Isn't that a wild thought? And notice it says the pursuit of happiness, not happiness. Why is that? Because we're pursuing it and all these other things and pleasure and still not getting there. It's like that gerbil on it, you know, like the hamster on the wheel. It's like I'm trying to get there and I can't quite get there. Have you ever had that season? Trying, I remember this season of my life was the college years. And yeah, someone's laughing because they're like, yeah. You'd. Isn't it wild? College is so crazy, by the way. It's like, you know, just turn your kids loose. It's like a nursery without the, the supervision. <laughs> and I remember showing up to like fraternity parties, man, and it was like anything goes. Anyone goes, anything goes, doesn't matter. Your whole goal in life was what? Pleasure, me, what feels good to me. And those of us that knew how to sin really good, it felt really good for a season. Do you know the Bible is audacious enough to say that sin is pleasurable for a <laughs> Oh man, I wish I could remember the song. Just this morning I was leaving the gym. Oh, what was it? There was a song that was talking about, oh man, it was a lady singer and she was talking about uh, I was oh, I'm under the influence and I don't care about the consequences. So I'm just gonna get high again. It broke my heart. I'm like, oh no. And what's the end of that? Oh, someone needs to pivot today, man. You need to pivot. There's no need to continue down that road. You're coming up empty every time. I remember days waking up and going, who's that? And you're like, what? That felt good, but now what? I was trying to what? Find purpose and meaning and pleasure. And man, it felt good, but then what? I'm broken and I'm still empty. And if I'm not careful, I'm on my way to suicide because I'm so darn empty. Why do I exist? And why? You're like, chill out, pastor. I'm like, I'm sorry, but I live this. I lived this personally, and I see the difference when you make the pivot, and now you can have purpose in the Son, Jesus Christ, and now you're free. You can still have a pleasurable life, and you can still have possessions, but man, it's different. And the striving is over. The striving is over. <laughs> Dude, I gotta read this out of 1 Kings chapter 11, because you need to see it for yourself. King Saul, if anyone could have had deep satisfaction in pleasure, it would have been him. Look at this. King Solomon loved many foreign women, Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, from among the, he didn't care. The Lord had clear, but watch this, the Lord clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they're gonna turn your hearts to their gods. God, God's not a party pooper, he just knows, man, I've made, I've made this beautiful thing called set one man, one woman for life, that's how it works. Fire, put that fire in the fireplace, hey, you get it out, it starts burning down houses. And yet, they knew it and still went outside. Look at three, this blows my mind. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, porcupines. <laughs> I'm like, dude, the brother had a 1,000 chicks anytime he wanted. Yeah, I'm kind of in the mood for a brunette. Let's go. And you think, and, and see, here's the thing. To this day, many of us dudes, we think if we could just have that, we'd be fulfilled. And you go, no, nah, man, I don't have access like King Solomon. Actually, you do. It's called pornography. And you have access to a 1,000 women, whatever you want, at any time. And then you click on that, and then the next day, you're like, am I fulfilled? Isn't it weird, though, when you, have, when you have sex with your spouse and you pray before at, guess what? Can I, I'm just getting, can I just get real in church for just for a second? Why am I so passionate? Because I know this feeling, man. You don't have to be bound by that anymore. You can be free. I was walking, I gotta share this, total side. I was walking Ding last night after church and uh, 
those of you who don't know, I have an Italian greyhound. His real name is Dash, but we call him Ding. I have no idea why. And I was walking him, and for some reason, he didn't eat all day long. We were gone, you know, working and different things. So I started walking him, and I'm walking him, and I look behind me, and he's, he's got something in his mouth. It's roadkill. It's like this dead, smashed frog, and he's I'm like, ding, what are you doing? Ding, ding, stop. And I'm like coming after him. He's like, oh, what? He's after me. He's, he's running away with the darn thing in his mouth. And it hit me like a ton of bricks, and he told me to tell someone in here, spouses specifically, quit, what is the word? Starving your spouse, because they're gonna go to roadkill. And I don't know who that's for. (laughs) And it goes both ways now. Denise and I have in our rhythm, one time a week, I'm pursuing her for physical intimacy. One time a week, she's pursuing me for physical intimacy. Hi. <laughs> Keep your, your spouse satiated, and they won't go running for roadkill. All right. Sorry. I'm, I'm just trying to be obedient to what God gives me. It's weird how my mind works. Hopefully it helps someone. And I want you to hear this, not as a shaming or a demeaning. I'm trying to equip the saints to live out God's best. Okay, you ready for three? Materialism, write it down. He, uh, he was sending it and just acquiring properties and different things. And once again, let me just pause and say, nothing wrong with possessions. The only thing that's wrong with possessions is when they possess you and I. That's it. I'm in this quandary right now in my life because the Bible says to leave an inheritance for your children's children. The Bible says work hard and be a blessing and give and give. But it also says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then he'll provide everything you need. So what is it? Yes, it's a tension that we manage. Look at the definition of materialism. This will hit you. The preoccupation with or the emphasis on material objects, comforts and considerations with a disinterest in or rejection of spiritual, intellectual, or cultural values. Isn't that interesting? And I don't know about you, man, but I, this is an ongoing struggle for me. I told you, it's a tension. This started early for me. I remember a Christmas, very vividly, I was really desiring to acquire an Atari. Now, those of you that don't understand what an Atari is, that was like the banging gaming system at the time. The thing was huge. And in my heart, I was like, dude, I will arrive if I get an Atari for Christmas this year. I won't need anything else again. <laughs> and sure enough, dude, like <laughs> I came down on that Christmas. I still see it. This is how impactful it is, how, how possessed I was by my possessions at the time. And it was this huge thing wrapped, and I was like, yes! And dude, I was like, you know, I was playing Pac-Man. I was like, bro, I, I, I'm, I'm good. I'm fulfilled in life. Until, what was next? Nintendo, RBI Baseball. I was no longer satiated and satisfied with my Atari. Then I was, dude. RBI, are you kidding me with Nintendo? But then, oh no, they brought out the Sega Genesis. Madden football on Sega Genesis? Now that, that goes to the garage sale, dude. Like, I, I'm walking in freedom. The same thing was happening with the bikes, you know? Like, I got this little Schwinn bike. Schwinn, remember the Schwinns? driving around the hood and going to the creek. Dude, it was great. But then my grandpa came and he bought me the mini goose. Remember the mongoose? It was the mini goose. Sorry, I'm losing all the young crowd right now. I, you have to Google all this stuff. I'm trying to connect with my old people real quick. But then it got to the cars. Oh no, when I get that car,
The subs, yeah, bro. You had to have the six by nines. I started with the 77 Monte Carlo with the six by nines. That thing didn't do anything. I Look at what Solomon says. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 4. Let's just read for a bit. I want the word of God to speak to us. This is what he, remember now, you gotta remember this. And the context of this book is fascinating. This is when he's older in life and he has a much better perspective. Remember now, Solomon, he wrote Song of Solomon, which we started today. Oh, I can't wait for next week. Uh, and he's young in love, and they're talking about this beautiful romance. His middle age, he, he writes all the Proverbs we just read. Did you know Ecclesiastes is later in life? Now he has perspective. He's tried it all. And this is what he says. I, I also, verse four, I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself, by planting beautiful vineyards. Again, nothing wrong with huge homes, beautiful vineyards, but when that, that's, Purpose and meaning in life. Under the sun, problem. I made gardens, parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. In other words, he had this huge staff, this amazing company he's running. I also owned large herds and flocks. Did you know this, by the way? I was studying this. Every day, Solomon had to have uh, 10 prime beef every day and 20 commercial beef every single day. They killed the, and made that fresh. It was like organic meat every single day. Can you imagine the amount of herds and flocks the dude had to have? More than any of the kings who had ever lived in Jerusalem before me. Look at verse eight. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces, I hired wonderful singers, including Justin Bieber and Beyonce. <laughs> Had many, many beautiful concubines, any, like the, the top chicks in the land I could just call on any time. This hit me when I was reading this. I had everything a man could desire. And yet he still wasn't fulfilled. I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me. My wisdom never failed me. Any, this, this, how about this? Tune this. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work and reward for all the labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. How about that? Isn't that crazy? And maybe you're here today or maybe you're listening online and you're like, oh my goodness, that's me. I've worked my entire life and I've been stacking the bank account. I've been building the business and all the while there's something in my soul that doesn't settle. I don't have peace. I can't even sleep. I gotta take medicine so I can go to sleep at night. Can I just tell you, you're missing one key thing, Jesus Christ who fulfills repentance and forgiveness and life in him for now and into eternity. That's what we miss. It's not another building. It's not another project. It's not another Entertainment, it's not another trip. All those are great if they're done in connection with God. Man, it's so dope. But man, we're missing it if we do it apart from God. Solomon was wild, dude. The heat. I was reading in, in uh, 1 Kings 10, he had these like ships, these like ships that would go out and just get gold and silver, like apes and monkeys and like peacocks. <laughs> they just go out and just grab him stuff. I was reading, I was like, how about a peacock? He, I just picture Solomon like, sick, my boats are coming back. You know, it's like, is that what peacocks do? I don't know, sorry. <laughs> then uh, remember the Queen of Sheba rolled in and gave him like the biggest spice rack. It's like the spice rack on steroids. I mean, the guy had anything he wanted. The result? What do you think is the result? I'm glad you asked. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 17. So I came to arrive at deep peace in my soul because I had everything I needed, material under the sun. Nope, I came to hate life because everything done here under the sun is so troubling. Everything's meaningless, like chasing the wind. Great, thanks, Solomon. I came to hate all my hard work here on earth for I 
must leave to others everything I have earned. Who can tell whether my successors will be wise or foolish? You built this huge business, but your kid's a knucklehead, and they're just gonna squander everything. Which Rehoboam did, if you follow the text, tragically. They'll control everything I've gained by my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless! So, what did he do? I gave up in despair, questioning the value of all my hard work in this world. That hit me when I was studying. I gave up in despair. Jesus said it this way. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? My goodness. Maybe you're depressed right now. Maybe, maybe that's, that's the issue is you're trying to find purpose and meaning and satisfaction and everything else under the sun, but you haven't connected with the sun. I, I came to bring you good news. You are getting the truth right here. You have opportunity to what? To pivot. Pivot. Wish I had basketball shoot. Pivot. Touch your neighbor. Say pivot. Pivot. Even Christians right now, you, you, you started off the right way and for whatever reason are drifting in distraction by thinking the possessions are gonna continue, they're gonna fulfill. What is it? It's a pivot. There's nothing wrong with that, but you gotta pivot. You gotta pivot. One of my favorite, I was studying in First, uh, first Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Listen to this. If God has blessed you with wealth, I love it because, man, some people are like, oh, if you have a lot of money, you're not really spiritual. And then they go the other side. If you're really poor, you really are. Well, maybe you're just lazy. And here's what he says. He says, teach those who are, this is Paul writing to Timothy, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud, not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all things we need for our enjoyment. I love that, man. I need to set someone free right now. If God's blessed you with a bunch of resource and you bring your first and best to him and you're always looking to bless others, it's okay to bless your family. Go on a vacation, send it, man. Enjoy it. Use your money to make memories. Bless your kids, your family. Have a great time. The Bible just said it. He's given us all things richly to enjoy, but he continues on. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works, generous to those in need. Always being ready to share with others. By doing this, you'll be storing up treasure as a good foundation for the future so that you may experience true life. Do adding to your heavenly 401k, moving it forward. It's powerful. I told you that at the beginning of this book, it gets a little depressing. But Solomon made a pivot at the end Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, so good. He made the pivot. He said, all right, guys, I've walked through this. I've tried this. I'm trying to help you out. I made the pivot, and here's the pivot. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Here it is, ready? Fear God, keep his commandments. This is man's all. I love it. And you're like, fear God, is that? Oh. Fear God is a reverential humility and a worship of God, you're number one. I wanna fear you, I'm gonna honor you, I'm gonna put you first in everything, and then guess what? I'm gonna enjoy life. It's not burdensome to keep your commandments, it's out of my love and appreciation for you, and that's how I'm gonna live life. And for the first time in your life, I don't know where the triangle is at, I'm gonna find it real quick. You can... Deep satisfaction and peace in your soul, amen? amen? God, thanks for this word so good that I need to hear this so often. So thank you for being faithful to write messages that help when I drift to keep me back on track. And I pray just an anointing over this church to have deep purpose and meaning in you, Jesus, to honor you, to bless others, that we live a true Love church lifestyle. And in that, whatever you bless us with, we're, we're good. Whether it's little or a lot. I love what Paul said. He, he learned to be content in all situations. And I pray that over our, this church in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I wanna conclude.